But what is up, everybody? We are here for episode number 12 of Beyond the Game. My name is Eric Michael. If you've never saw me before, I've sold over $5 million in sports cards. I own a multiple seven-figure coaching program that teaches people how to make money with sports cards. It's a passion of mine. It's fundamentally changed my life, and I love teaching it to others. And I do these podcasts to talk about my life, my story, things on my mind, ways to make money in sports cards, sports in general, business, productivity, and all that good stuff. And I have a few things here to talk about today. So over the weekend, I was at Fanatics Fest. By the way, if you're watching this and I'm not in my usual background, I'm actually in my parents' backyard doing this podcast because all the flights in the New Jersey, New York area were just getting delayed. So my flight got pushed back two days, but I try not to skip a beat and still want to do these podcasts. And I was at Fanatics Fest over the weekend. Um, Incredible event. Just like, I mean, it was amazing. Honestly, like right in the middle of New York City. I mean, I know a lot of people had trouble getting in and out of New York City, but for me, it's easy because I'm from New Jersey. So, but for me, it was amazing. Like, there was so much to do, so many events. The sports card show was really, really good. I think it's going to pick up a lot of wind. The sports card show is going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And apparently, there's a Fanatics Fest in Pittsburgh in a month or so, and then again in Orlando. It probably won't be as big. And uh, yeah, cards with friends. It was uh, so yeah, we set up. It was thirty five hundred dollars for our table. Um, that's how much it was. You had to pay a little bit extra if you wanted more dealer passes. So, yeah, it was expensive for a table. Like it was the same price as the national card show. Um, for us, well, you know what? I'm actually biased because for us, like not only do I go there to buy and sell sports cards, I go there to record content um, for major league profits, and also I go there and get people interested in my coaching program and sell and sell it to them. So. It is, so for us, it was really good. $3,000 for a table if you're just buying and selling sports cards. Probably not. The show probably had like five, 600 tables at it. Uh, but it's going to continue to get bigger. So maybe from just a sports card angle, it wasn't worth it to buy a table. But for like Major League Profits as a whole and for myself, it was definitely worth it. Um, And one of the most rewarding things I did. So a bunch of kids came up to me, a bunch, I guess a bunch of kids, uh, like 10, 12, 15 years old, watch my uh, YouTube channel and help them start to make money with sports cards, which is amazing because sports cards changed my life. Um, and I started doing it when I was just about 17 years old. So it's always nice for people to come up to me and say, hey, I made money on this card because of your channel or I learned what grading was or I learned that I can make money with sports cards. So that's always nice. A um, few things I want to talk about today, though. So I did an interview with a previous student of mine. So this is actually a crazy story. Well, Tic Tacs aren't coming out. So crazy story. So just when I was beginning Major League Profits, this had to be in 2019 or 2020. I was at a poker table in Atlantic City playing poker, and I probably had a few drinks, and I met someone by the name of Adam Gold. And we talked about sports cards. I told him I was starting this coaching program. And he texted me a few months later, joined the program. And I'm telling you this story because it's kind of relatable to me and it could be relatable to you as well. It fundamentally changed his life. So he got into sports cards, didn't really know much about it. His grandpa or pops back in the day used to own a sports card shop in Pennsylvania, I believe is what he told me. And... You know, he knew there was some money in sports cards, didn't really know that much about it, got in right in the beginning of the pandemic, so that helped because everything just went up in value during the pandemic. But, so he started buying and selling sports cards, and now he does four to $500,000 a year in sales, okay? That's the that's the good part about it, right? And he probably makes like, I don't know, 50 to 100 grand a year in profit. If I had to guess, I'm just guessing. But number two is... Adam is a CPA, okay, and he used to work for an accounting firm. And because of sports cards, sports cards let him quit working for an accounting firm. He was able to start his own, and about half his clients actually come from sports cards. So it's kind of similar to me where I go to these sports card shows not only to buy and sell sports cards, but I also go there to record content for you guys um, to get people interested into the idea of making money with sports cards and then you know, we sell you into the program and you learn how to do it and you make a lot of money. Same thing for him. He goes to these sports card shows, not only to flip sports cards, make money, have fun, bring his son, which is great, but he also goes there to getting accounting, to get accounting clients. Um, so it's I, like, I love it because, you know, sports cards, can you make 20, 30 grand a month? You could. It's hard. Sports cards are a really good way to make like five, six, seven, eight grand a month. Like if you're good at it, maybe you can make a little bit more, but there's ways to use sports cards as a stepping stone and take things to the next level. 
like I did and like my buddy Adam did. You could, you know, it, you get so much entrepreneurial experience from it and you're able to just branch off of it like I did with starting a coaching program like Adam did with using sports cards, using the people in sports cards to get clients to start his accounting firm. So something to think about, like sports cards is it's amazing because like, Owning an accounting firm or like starting a, a coaching program and with like 30 plus employees now, it's complicated, right? There's a lot of skills you have to learn, like accounting and finance and softwares and sales and all this stuff. But with sports cards, it's, it allows you to get into business and make money yourself without complication. Like with making money in sports cards is relatively easy compared to other things. Like it's just you're flipping sports cards. There's no clients. There's no meetings. There's no employees. There's no softwares. It's just all you're doing is you're flipping sports cards. Um, and that's why I always say, if you've ever seen my ads before, which you probably have, it's the easiest way to start making a few extra grand a month. And the most important part about that is it proves to yourself that you can make money. Like some of you guys watching this right now have probably tried multiple ways to make money online and it's never worked, right? And the reason it's never worked is because all these opportunities, trust me, I've done them, they're hard, like drop shipping and affiliate marketing and Amazon. It requires a lot of upfront money, learning how to advertise and deal with suppliers and all this crap. However, with sports cards, it's just... There's just not much to it. You're just flipping these cards. Like, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, so pretty amazing story. Um, I'll go over some um, some Q&As. Um, got some questions. So Andre said or asked me, how do I keep, excuse me, how do I keep active customers? I'm assuming you mean active customers with sports cards. So it's not a matter of like having active customers. It's about a it's a matter of having active cards. So like, as long as you're buying the right stuff at the right time and selling the right stuff at the right time, your customers or people that buy from you are going to keep messaging you and you're going to be able to keep selling cards. Like, don't expect, like, you should be reaching, you should be buying cards yourself, getting them graded, flipping them, and reaching out to your customer base. So if you if your customers aren't active, all that means is you're not buying either at all or you're just not buying the right stuff to sell the right stuff at the right time. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's see. Mikey says, <laughs> don't say this about yourself, Mikey. Mikey says, okay, I know I'm not very smart, but will, will you please do a separate video on PSA submissions? Next question. Are there any monthly subscriptions out there that you think are very helpful? I saw PSA has one. There was another one, Sports Collectors Digest. I guess that sounds like some sort of news article. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but to answer your question with the PSA submissions, honestly, Mikey, it is a little bit confusing. So basically the way it works is, let me look it up. I'll look it up for you. Um, PSA pricing. So let's see here. Okay. So right now while I'm speaking, Mikey, this is the way it works. All right. So. There's something called value bulk, which is $18.99 per card to get graded. And you could only use that service if the card is worth 500 bucks or less. Okay. If the card goes over $500, like for example, you could have a card that's 300 bucks. And when it grades at 10, now it's worth $800. They're going to charge you more. I don't know ex exactly how much more, but in order to use the value bulk service, you need to use, send in at least 20 cards at a time. So that's value bulk. Then there's value, which is $24.99 per card. And you could send in one card, 10 cards, 100 cards at a time with value. And same thing. It's only for cards worth $500 or less. So once it's worth more than $500, PSA is going to upcharge you to probably the next service level, which is like the next declared value service level, which is regular, which would be 75 bucks. Then there's value plus, which is $39.99 per card. And that just gets back to you quicker, but same concept. It's only cards worth $500 or less. Then the next tier is regular, where you could have a card worth $1,500 or less, and it's $75. And it, according to the website, it takes about 10 business days to get back to you. Then the next service level is $129, which is cards for $2,500 or less. Um, then the next is Super Express, which is $249. And it's cards worth $5,000 or less. And the next is Walkthrough. That's $500 to get a card graded. And it's cards worth $10,000 or less. And it's a little weird how it works. Like if you do the walkthrough service and it costs you $500 to get that card graded, and let's say the card is worth $7,000, but now you submit it to PSA, it gets a 10, and now it's worth $20,000, they're going to charge you more, okay? I know. 
you're probably thinking to yourself, that's weird. It's strange. Like, doesn't it, isn't PSA incentivizing themselves to give people tens? Because if they give people tens, these cards are worth more. Now they can charge people more. But I don't think they do that because they, what's in their best long term interest for the business is controlling the population of cards. So PSA tens hold their value. So I don't think they would ever do that. Um, especially the people grading the cards are employees. They don't actually get more money for giving out more tens or nines. At least I don't think so. So that's how, hopefully that answers your question, Mikey. Um, I, I, it's not, it is kind of confusing. All right. Brock asked me, what's your process for profit? Once you make money on a card, do you tuck it away in a bank? I always end up putting everything back into cards and I'll lose on a couple cards and lose that previous profit. Uh, okay, good question. So, Brock, there is no like straightforward answer, but I'll tell you exactly what I did, and hopefully you could run with it. So, when I had less money, and I was messing around with like four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars, I made it my mission where at the most on hand I would only have a couple hundred dollars on me. All I did was I kept relentlessly investing back into cards. Like, if I had more than like a thousand bucks on me, I'd be like, why do I have this money on me? Because Money just sitting in the bank does nothing, right? You want it, you want your money working for you, whether you're grading cards or buying cards already graded to flip them. So obviously, like keep enough where you're able to sleep at night and you're able to pay the bills. And once again, this is coming from someone I have a massive tolerance for risk. Like if I have a hundred thousand dollars to my name, I don't care if I have a thousand dollars in cash and ninety nine thousand dollars in cards. So like there is an element of like risk to it, right? Like or like tolerance for risk. Like if you have a low tolerance for risk, maybe keep a little bit more cash on hand. I just, I'm just a very, I'm, I have like a gambler's mentality. I'm very aggressive when it comes to money. So that is how I do things. Um, I don't like having a lot of cash on hand because, you know, as long as you could have enough to pay rent, pay for food, I mean, what's the point of just looking at more money in the bank account? Like my grandpa was like that. I'm sure a bunch of you guys' grandpas were like that. Like he was just obsessed with how much money he had in his bank account, right? But like, okay, you look at it, it's a number. It gives you a 10 second dopamine hit. All right, but you're actually costing yourself money, right? Because there's something in this world called opportunity cost. And by you just storing money in the bank, that money could be working for you, making you 20, 30% a year or every six months. And you're at, by you not investing that money, you're costing yourself 20% or 30%. So if you look at it from that angle, like don't be that guy that just gets obsessed with like looking at your bank account every single day because I know people like that. Just don't, like you should be getting excited by investing your money and not having a lot of money in your bank account. In my opinion, that's the best way to make money. Um. All right, so Brock, hopefully that answers your question. Scott says, Oh, this is actually good. Eric, what are the best avenues or places to sell one's cards to get a reasonable price for them that you've experienced? Thanks, Scott in Kentucky. Well, Scott in Kentucky. I actually have a very straightforward answer for you. So, repackers buy cards at 90% of the value. If you don't know what a repacker is, a repacker is someone that buys a bunch of cards from people. They take the cards, they put them in, they make their own packs. They call these packs like... Eric's packs or whatever name they come up with and they resell them to people um, at a profit. So they're able to, buy, because they're able to like repackage these cards and like put them in the cases, they're able to buy these cards at 90% and get 120, 130% for them because they're selling them in the form of packs. Like the people that are buying the packs, yeah, they're going to lose a lot of money, but selling to repackers is an amazing way. I just sold like $60,000 in cards to one. He gave me like 90% on all the cards, so he gave me like 55000 or something like that. Um, but yeah, so repackers are really good. And then second to that, which is kind of along the same lines, is so building up that social media base. So like when you go and sell cards, let's say you buy a card for 100 bucks and you get it graded now, it's worth 300 bucks. Instead of trying to sell that card for $300 and get every last dollar, try to sell it for 260 270 280 on Facebook because someone will buy it right away as long as you're buying the right stuff. And then you're able to uh, do a deal with someone, get their contact information. And over time, you become that person that everyone wants to do deals with because you are discounting your cards a little bit, which actually makes you more money in the long run because instead of you holding cards for you know months and months on end, you're able to sell them right away. Sure, you get a little bit less cash up front, but you're able to take that money and reinvest it quicker, which means you're just making more money in the long term. And people like you. And it's easier to sell these cards. And it's less stressful. So something to think about, Scott. Um, 
All right. <laughs> Roberto said, <laughs> this is a good one. If you are openly teaching people how to fuck eBay while still using their platform and potentially driving up the cost for people who don't cheat the system by screenshotting your contact info, how can I trust that paying you as a coach, you won't somehow fuck me over? That's a good question, Roberto. So what Roberto is referring to is what I'll do if I'm, if I'm buying a bigger card on eBay, I will, instead of like trying to do the deal on eBay, I'll send them a screenshot of my contact information via a picture, via like an attached image so eBay can't read it and we're able to do a deal off of eBay. Uh, well, Roberto, what I would say is I have taught this to thousands of people and myself have given eBay, I mean, I've spent millions of dollars on eBay. Um, you know, business is business. It's not like it's something illegal. Everybody does it. Um, I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say if eBay had to uh, go back in time and delete me off the earth, if they had the option, I'm sure they would not because I've given them just massive amounts of business. And the reason I do that is because the people that pay me money and the people that watch my content, I want you guys to make as much money as possible. So like, um, as you could probably tell from watching my videos, I'm very authentic. That's exactly what I do. Um, you know, it's not something illegal. Maybe eBay should, if eBay lessened their fees, people probably wouldn't do that, but they have massive fees. So, and I want to see people make as much money as possible. Um, but so I wouldn't say, uh, you know, <laughs> I, that I fuck over eBay and then how can I trust that paying you as a coach? You won't somehow fuck me over. I mean, me as a coach, honestly, it's, you're not dealing with me as much. You are, but you're dealing with more of the information that I provide. So, um, like coaching, the way it works is like, you know, trust me, like I'm not out here to like take your money and, you know, take it to Las Vegas and put it all in black on a roulette table. Um, if I was doing that, right, you'd see, ma you'd see massive Reddit threads about how I'm the biggest scammer in the world and maybe there'll be a, a Netflix documentary on me, like somehow running, you know, have you seen the Netflix documentaries on running Ponzi schemes? But yeah, me as a coach, like, you know, I've sold millions of dollars in cards pretty successfully. I give you all the information exactly how I've done it and part of it is that whole eBay tactic and then it's up to you uh, whether or not you're going to execute on it. Um, so, like, yeah, I mean, I guess just Google my name if you think I would fuck you over. There's like hundreds and hundreds of positive reviews. That's the that's the best thing I have to say, Roberto. Um, all right, so this is a fake name, but <laughs> he put his name as D's Nuts. So D's Nuts says, if you hang on to a card before flipping them, how do you keep track of what you're sitting on? Wait, if you hang on to cards before flipping them, how do you keep track of what you're sitting on? I, I'm assuming you buy more than a couple at a time, that is. You know, a very intelligent question, these nuts, but you gave me a fake name. Um, yeah, so all you do is, so what I do is I have, I have a spreadsheet uh, with all the cards. So like the card I bought, how much I paid, the platform I got it from, and then um, what I sold it for. So if what I sold it for, if that column is blank, then I know I'm still sitting on that card. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, hopefully that answers your question, D's. Um, Brandon says, wouldn't other card buyers search around and find the cheaper cards like we'd be doing? Possibly finding and buying from the same company we bought ours from? Uh, I don't know exactly what you're asking, Brandon, but I think you do. Um, so when it comes to cards, like so that is a very common question. Um, I get like, well, you're teaching the same tactics to everybody. Aren't we competing with each other? I think you're asking something along those lines. Well, what I would say to that is like, there's thousands of cards uploaded to eBay every day. There's hundreds of thousands of cards on eBay. I mean, me personally, like, you know, there's like a few thousand people that are joining my program, right? So um, just we're like a tiny, tiny fish in a massive, massive, massive ocean. You have to keep in mind, most people in sports cards... They're your average collector, right? So they're just like, when you buy a card of like Will Levis, for example, and let's say you buy it for a hundred bucks and you sell it for $300, right? And now let's say you get it graded, now it's worth 300 bucks. Like 95% of people in sports cards are that person that like, you know, I think Will Levis is gonna be good. So I'm gonna buy his cards. And that's who we sell our cards to. So what I would say is, like, you have to remember, 95% of people aren't fishing out there to make a quick profit like we are. And there's nothing wrong with it, right? It's just like stocks, right? You have your day traders and you have your long-term traders. Most people in sports cards are long-term traders, right? They 
buy cards of people, um, hoping they'll go up in value, hoping they'll play well, just like no different than buying a stock of Disney or Google or whatever, and hoping that goes up in value. Right? It's the same exact concept. And all we're doing is we're day trading and we're flipping for the people that are long-term trading. That's a uh, that's all that's going on. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Brandon, because like there's so many cards uploaded to eBay every single day, and then just 95 percent of people don't do what we do. Um, so okay, so Rick James asks, can you talk about the differences between hobby boxes, blaster boxes, mega box, and whatever boxes are out there? Um, so actually, I'm not I'm not the expert on this, but what I could tell you. It's not, I don't rip open boxes much, to be honest with you, Rick. But so hobby boxes are usually, so they're more expensive and they have the better types of variations and colors of them. And you can't find those at retail places. So like blaster boxes and mega boxes, you could find those at retail places. When I say retail, I literally mean retail, like Targets, Walmarts, places like that. Um, Targets and Walmarts, they have like, crappier cards they're cheaper right and then the good types of variations of cards like those come out um in hobby boxes and to get hobby boxes you have to buy them online get them from sports card shops places like that so like panini saves the good stuff like sports card shops and breakers and the bad stuff for like target and walmart but at the same time you get it you know it's cheaper for target and walmart because you know, the stuff's not as good. If you ever look on a, here's a good example of that to really like pin down exactly what I'm saying. This is like an interesting example. So one of the first cards that was ever worth a lot of money um, that was not graded is the 2011 Trout Update. Um, so Rick, so go on eBay. And if you look at the 2011 Trout Update, there's two types of expensive variations. There's multiple variations, but there's two types of expensive ones. One is called the Red. It's literally called the Target Red Update. Another one is called the blue, the Walmart blue. Literally, the border of the card is blue because Walmart's colors are blue. So they like like tops made the cards specifically for Walmart. And you can only get in a Walmart's. And the same thing for Target. Literally, tops made these red bordered cards and only put them in packs in packs in Target. Because um, I don't know, that's just what they did. Um, but those are like the, a premium example of like retail carts. So hopefully that makes sense. And the, the target ones, because the borders are red, they get damaged very easily. I mean, those cards were worth like 60, 70 grand at one point during the pandemic. Now they're probably worth like 15 grand if I had to guess. But yeah, so that's like a good example of like the beginning of like retail. Oh, but yeah. So like blaster and mega boxes, retail places, Target and Walmart, hobby boxes, better, more expensive better types of variations, card shops and breakers and stuff like that. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Mikey says, what does pop two or pop nine mean? I see it on some cards, but not all. So basically what population means is how many, usually, usually when people are talking about it, is how many of PSA 10s are there in the world. So if I have a silver Wemben Yama 2023, Three prison. It's a common, it's a very common card. The population on it, if someone's talking about it, they might say this is pop 600. That means there's 600 PSA 10s as opposed to like, like, uh, I don't know, like a Joe Burrow number to 99 National Treasures 2020 auto. The population on that card is probably like nine. There's probably like, or PSA 10s, there's probably like three actually, if I had to guess. So the pop on that is three. It's a rare card. Um, so less pop. Usually, it would make more on your money if you bought the card raw. Because usually, the less of the pop, right? If you just think about this logically, less of the pop, what does that mean? It means probably the card is harder to grade. If the card's harder to grade, it's a 10. Well, you're probably going to make more money on it. So, hopefully, that makes sense. And then, there's a question from S. Lurch on Instagram. Are you just using prior paid auctions as, on eBay as your understanding of the market rate on each card or another source to determine the value? That's that's actually a good question too. Um, so to answer that question, so it depends on the card. So if I'm buying a, a more expensive card that's like thousand bucks plus, a lot of the time, honestly, I use Alt. Alt, honestly, is a clunky app and it kind of sucks, but it doesn't miss any, uh, it doesn't miss any like sales. 
um, of an expensive card so I can see what everything is worth when it's sold. And like, for example, if I'm buying an expensive card that's like $5,000 and there's none that have sold in a year, well, I could look back at the past year and say, okay, what did this card sell for in a year, a year ago? And then I could look at it as like Silver Prism PSA 10 or more common card to see like, is this market up or down to kind of get, justify paying whatever I should be paying. So for more expensive cards, I use Alt a lot of the time or Market Movers. To, and it takes me a little bit longer, but I just don't want to screw up. And then for, what was the other question? Oh yeah. So for lower end cards where I don't, where like they, they're a lot more commonly sold, I'll use eBay or 130 point. Um, because there's going to be many, much more data points. It's just easier to see, and it's way quicker. And I'll use completed sales like or best offer and um, auctions. Auctions are a truer sign of what a card is worth because people fake best offer, like offers accepted all the time so they can increase the value of a certain card. Um, but I use both. And then on eBay, I don't know if you know this, so when you look at a card that was accepted at best offer, eBay actually doesn't tell you what the card sold for. So you could download a cardboard, a Chrome extension called Cardboard, what's it called? Cardboard Market, I think, and it'll tell you, or you could go on 130point.com and look there and it'll tell you what the card actually sold for because eBay won't. Um, so Troy says, how to get started with no money. <laughs> okay, so if you have no money, you should definitely get a job. And save your money and lower your expenses. <laughs> that's uh. So if you literally have no money, that's what you should do. You should not start a business if you have no money. And then once you get a job or you lower your bills and you're able to save up some money and you have like a five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, what I would do is go to sports card shows and go through the dollar boxes, like you know those dollar boxes um that are on the side. So like at a sports card dealer at a show, right? You'll see like um like a glass table with their more expensive cards and on the side you'll see dollar boxes what i would do is go through the dollar boxes and find cards in there you can flip for like 10 bucks 20 bucks 30 bucks they're in there all the time um and that'll get you started you can make money right away you could prove to yourself that you could actually make money and not a lot of upfront investment right because it only costs a dollar so hopefully that makes sense um some other stuff i wanted to talk about is so I've been getting some questions on VAs. So let me let me explain let me explain to you guys what a VA is. All right. So a VA, the word v, the letters VA stands for virtual assistant. These are usually employees overseas, usually in the Philippines, sometimes India, sometimes South America. And the beauty about VAs is because, like in the Philippines, for example, you could pay someone three to four bucks U.S. dollars an hour, and because the U.S. dollar carries a lot of weight in like some places like the Philippines, you can have someone work for you and they can be paid above minimum wage in their country and it only costs us three, four bucks an hour. So for example, in my, in my program, we do this all the time. I show people how to use VAs. So instead of you spending an hour or two hours a day looking at cards, you can have a VA search, have a shared spreadsheet, and we train them on exactly how to find the cards and what to look for, how to know if it's a good deal, how to negotiate all the stuff. And once it's good, they put it on a spreadsheet with their student or whoever they're working for. And, you know, they work for a few hours a day. We're able to outsource it for six to nine bucks an hour. And, you know, it's great because, like, you know, at the end of the day, you look at the spreadsheet, you buy some cards. It took about five minutes to buy some of these cards. And you're able to, able to outsource a few hours of work for, like, you know, six bucks, nine bucks. And even in my own business, the Major League Profits, like, some of these VAs overseas in the Philippines are, like, smarter than us and they work harder than us. Like, the thing about the Philippines and, like, over, a lot of these overseas countries is – like working is culture. Like that is what people are born and raised to do. Like respect whatever job they do. And like, I speak for this, like, right. I have like 30 employees and a lot of the overseas wor workers are much harder workers than the Americans. Um, like us as Americans, right. Not to like cause a shit storm here but right think about it we're given participation trophies when we grow up and we're told we, we could be whatever we want to be and we're f you know filled up with all this crap our whole life um so a lot of these americans when they get into the workforce they're just they complain you know they have bad days all the time and you have to deal with a lot of their emotions like take my word for it, like having people overseas work for you they are for the most part a lot better at uh keeping their emotions in check and just completing tasks on time just because of the culture 
they're brought up in. Um, so using overseas assistance and you're, if you're able to train them on to do whatever, even if you own a business to do something else, I strongly recommend it. I mean, they're just, a lot of them are American educated. They speak really good English and a lot of the time they're much harder workers to be honest with you. Um, and that's where I'll leave it off at. Actually, I'll leave it off at one last thing. I like to make predictions on these podcasts, um, and see if they come true and look back, um, later on. Here's a fantasy football sleeper. This is random here, but this is a fantasy football sleeper. You want to know a good one? I'll tell you guys a good one. Ready for this? Cincinnati Bengals, starting tight end, Mike Gusecki. Probably be like a 10th, 12th round pick if I had to guess. That He's going to have a great year. They say he looks good in the Bengals camp. And he's like he was on the Patriots for like a while, and the Patriots suck. They haven't had a quarterback for years, and their offense sucks. But Mike Gusecki in Penn State, that guy was an animal and when he was in the Dolphins he was really good as well I'm telling you mark my words assuming he doesn't get hurt hopefully he doesn't he's gonna have a really good year in fantasy football that's my prediction um it looks like my Bo Nix prediction was right I think he's having an incredible preseason he had like 20 for 33 with like what was it, like 300 yards and two touchdowns um but because of Sean Payton like it's where you go and like Mike Gusecki where he went Patriots sucked Bengals he's gonna get a lot of opportunities especially uh What's his name? Tyler Boyd is gone, who worked the middle of the field. Um, and Burroughs never had a real, real tight end. So mark my words. I think, I think, I think Mike Gusecki is going to have a really good year. But hopefully you enjoyed this podcast. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me a message. Um, like, comment, subscribe. Hopefully you enjoyed this stuff. And I'll see you guys in the next one.